Hello, and welcome to The Pseudo Show, where business meets open source, a proud member of the Tux Digital Network. On today's episode, we are going to talk about the most important conference that happens in the dead of winter, which is FOSDEM and also CentOS Connect. And as always, joining me here in the production studio are Brandon and Neil. How are both of you doing? I'm doing all right. It's uh, it's an interesting it's interesting being in the studio. Well, uh, Studio Connecticut, and I'm you know I'm in Studio Utah. So I'm very proud of my studio. I'll have both of you know. And yes, Neil is sitting about five feet away from me. So I'm going to point at Neil, and he's going to point at me, and our fingers just about touch from where we are. But Neil, you were actually not five feet away pretty recently. You were actually traveling around a little bit, going to a couple of conferences, one of which was FOSDEM and the other one which was CentOS Connect. So I'm very interested to hear about your experience at both of those conferences, and maybe you could share some of the more interesting details of each one with us. Yeah, sure. Like, um, so this year, um, CentOS Connect and FOSDEM. Well, FOSDEM's always in Brussels in Belgium um, at the first weekend of February. So and, you just happened to sprout up there. Well, I was up there for CentOS Connect, which is the f- couple of days before. And uh, yeah, so CentOS Connect is the event that uh, CentOS contributors come together to talk about what they're doing and meet up and plan and all that other fun stuff Um, from the various SIGs, such as the Hyperscale SIG, um, the Alternative Images SIG, which is brand new, as well as some of the others, uh, talking about what they want to do, what they're doing, and, um, and really just kind of being an entry point for people to uh, see the CentOS community and, and interact with it. And then of course, FOSDEM is the largest open source conference in the world. uh, As far as I'm aware, like a community led open source conference, it's the largest one. It's, uh, it's done in ULB university of the Brussels university in, in Brussels, Belgium. And it's like 8,000 plus people each year. I don't know how they managed to put all those people in that bit, in that facility, but there, there you go. And I got to see, you know, it, it's impossible to see everything. Thankfully, everything is recorded, but I was there and in person to be able to hang out with some people as well as go to a few things here and there and uh, get some interesting insights. What would you say was the most interesting talk that you got to attend over at Fosdom. I The only thing I actually got to see Saturday outside of going to the booths was going to the Birds of a Feather panel on Flatpak and Flathub, which was interesting because, well, I went to the one from last year, and so I went to this one this year, and it's interesting to see that how some things have changed and most of it has kind of stayed the same. Flathub continues to kind of struggle a little bit with the dynamic of being a publisher, a distributor, and a delivery mechanism for applications. And there's still the question of how do you figure out funding and maintainership and support for the the work that people do and stuff. So all that is still kind of going on. And the new thing that was discussed this year, I think from last year, was really talking about this concept of what they want to call as direct uploads, which is where flat packs are not built from source on FlatHub. The application developer builds it on private infrastructure and just up to uploads a binary blob to FlatHub to, to release. There's a lot of challenges around being able to enable that workflow and some hesitancy around it in itself, too. The end result of this, I don't think I came away with any particular conclusion one way or the other, but I feel like FlatHub and Flatpak has just entered the beginning rounds of the same kind of questions we asked ourselves when we were making distributions 20 years ago. And so I think it's going to be interesting to see how that dynamic plays out over the long term, because I know Flatpak and uh, I know that FlatHub has tried to see itself as not a distribution, but it very much increasingly seems to behave like one. What do you mean by that? Just like how how the Flatpaks are uh, 
built? So when you look at flat packs that are built from source, they have the build system infrastructure, they do all these checks and they make sure that they're following these certain rules and stuff. But also that they're kind of, they're also shipping the binary artifacts. They're also delivering those things. They're presenting them. They're giving hosting and all this other stuff. I mean, if you look at what a distribution does at the end of the day, a distribution is something that collects binaries and makes them available in a way that you can get them from a central location. That's what a distribution is. And Flathub very squarely fits that bill. The other part of it is Flathub's a publisher because, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're they're basically operating on the behalf of these either application authors or third parties that are building these things for the for this stuff. There's these interesting questions about like, okay, so what's a developer? What's a publisher? What's the maintainer like all these are three different people and how do you represent that information and how do you handle that these are all questions that have not really been fully worked out from a flat hub point of view and i think some of it comes from these people like not really wanting to acknowledge the fact that they've kind of evolved into a distribution of sorts right to the point that you know the flat pack runtime that's on that's used by a lot of the flat packs is actually maintained on flat hub as well right it's the mm-hmm. what they call the free desktop runtime that's maintained by the code think folks mm-hmm. but that's a distribution right yeah the applications no, it, that are on top are essentially distribution level problems it, that makes sense because like uh cause anything using that runtime now as is built against that runtime uh whereas like flat packs uh, are coming from the Fedora project are built on the Fedora runtime and, but also packaged slightly differently. Uh, maybe not slightly, but it is a, there is a difference in package in, in how it, maybe not packaging, but how it's built. Cause uh, sure. the Fedora ones are, uh, look more like containers versus the flat hub flat packs. Right. The flat up flat packs still use the OS tree native storage format. Whereas the Fedora ones and the Red Hat ones, well, let's not forget that Red Hat also provides a Red Hat runtime for certified applications mm-hmm. that you can download and install applications from, from the Red Hat certified application. I don't actually know what they call it, but it's the Red Hat Marketplace, I think. Yeah, uh, is what it's actually called. Yeah, they used to have a bunch of different names, and I think it's all now called the Red Hat Marketplace. But like Fedora flat packs and the Red Hat Marketplace apps are built against the Fedora runtime and the RHEL runtime, respectively. And these runtimes are packaged as OCI images. And so your applications are built as OCI layered images on top of those. I get where you're coming from there. That That's an interesting perspective because I, I never really thought of it that way as it's turning into a essentially uh maybe a layer on top of a distribution on top of a distribution because you're running it obviously running it on a distribution flat hub's not distributing a linux distribution but well they're distributing everything but yeah, a linux but, kernel yeah they're distributing everything you need to run the app so that that makes yeah i it makes total sense how, uh, how you can get get to that have. Yeah, the biggest struggle they seem to have is acknowledging this, and it's making some of the discussions they're having about what they want to do going forward harder. Because, because once you get past that hill of ac- acknowledging that you are in fact a distribution, some of the policy questions that you have afterwards are a lot easier to start actually thinking about because you are now answering the same kind of questions that Linux distributions have to do, or BSD distributions have to do or Solaris, Illumos, Open Indiana distributions have to do, or whatever. In the Windows world, portableapps.com. I don't know if it's still a thing, but it was a thing 20 years ago. Yes, it is still a thing. Yeah, that is also a distribution of software. They have to worry about all the same things. Like, FlatHub is much closer to this portable apps distribution center where they're rewrapping and repackaging and then reshipping these things and having to observe the compliance for all this stuff. But if you don't acknowledge that that's a thing you have to worry about, then it gets to be messy. And in the same way, you know, to be fair, this is not just FlatHub exclusively. Snapcraft is in a similar boat. They have, you know, this similar, not a distribution mentality going on here as well. 
And, well, and let's not even talk about app images, which is a whole bottle of mess. I have well, a simple solution for all of this. Go back to Java for everything. Bill? No. Well, well, all of that is very interesting. And that's that's a I never really thought about looking at FlatHub as almost a, a distribution. Uh, when I go to conferences, one of the things that I obviously look for is who is the coolest booth with the best swag. So I'm very curious at a conference like Fosdem where you've got, you know, 8,000 visitors. I'm sure there are a lot of players at the table. Uh, they have some very interesting demos or booths or other swag. So as you walked around in your best opinion, who do you think had the coolest booth and why? Oh, man. So it's actually kind of a toss up in terms of the coolest booth. I would say like the closest to a coolest booth that I saw it was a toss up between the KD and the Alma booth. The KD booth was really cool because they had they had demos of like the Steam Deck and a tablet and a laptop. And it was and they had people that were like actually excited to chat and talk to you and like show you neat things. And like the engagement on the KD booth was excellent. The Alma booth was cool because there were people. Um, so Benny and Jonathan from the Alma Alma team were both there and they were just so happy and excited to talk about Alma. They were just so happy and excited to be there. They were so happy and excited to be part of the community. And they're on that journey of, of self-discovery of being their own thing, even being a rel compatible platform of being their own thing and making their own decisions. And it's so fascinating watching them do it and being part of that as well. Um, but you know what? The best swag thing I ever got at a conference, I got at the Alma booth. And you know what it was? What? You would never guess. It was a stick of lip balm. I guess that's probably one of the most useful things that you could have at a conference. I have never ever, ever gotten such a practical thing as swag at a conference ever. And you know what? I used that lip balm the whole bloody time because my lips and my throat would have been ruined otherwise. Especially my lip because I was talking all the time and everything was drying out. It's like it's a very warm and heated environment and it was very dry inside the buildings. So. I remember when I was at scale last year, I bumped into the team that created Snipe IT, which is a phenomenal open source inventory and asset management tool that that we use every day. And I think one of the things that I enjoyed the most about meeting that team at the conference is I got to thank them for their hard work and their dedication to their project. And I made it a point to leave the booth that I was covering to meet them and express to them how much I appreciated the effort that they put into their project and how we use it every day across our some of our educational clients and how we use it to track assets. And that was, to me, one of the most important things that I could do at that conference. And I encourage anybody to do when they attend a conference is find the booth for the project that you use the most, go over to the developers, and please thank them for the work that they're putting into their project. I can't stress that enough, that it makes their day when you tell them your project is awesome, we acknowledge the work that you do, please keep it up and and let them know. It, it, it makes such a difference to them when you tell them how much their, their work is appreciated. I can tell you over, I don't know, a decade and a half of doing this, I can count on my hand the number of times I've been thanked for the work that I've done. I've... Uh said this several times or a couple of pseudo show monologues of mine uh, that you can go back and listen to, but don't forget to pay them or at least donate. And sometimes it's not just the flashy application that you use in your day to day that needs some love and attention. It might be something underlying that you're not aware of or you don't think about. Mm hmm. An example might be FlatHub. Maybe you're a, a Linux user who runs something like 
CoreOS or Fedora Keonite or OpenSUSE MicroOS. And underneath all of that, you're running a lot of flat packs from FlatHub. Maybe thinking about giving a small donation to a project like FlatHub helps that project stay around for just a little bit longer or helps you give back to something that you may not even realize you use every day. I'm just looking at the at who attended, who had the who had booths. And also like the the tracks, like the developer rooms, et cetera. Did you pop into the AI and machine learning dev room? I did not. Unfortunately, as you might or may not be aware, Fostum is huge. And it is very difficult to find all the different dev rooms. Uh Especially well, when you've I, only been there once or twice and don't know how the campus is laid out. Oh, well, I'm like trying to count how many. Th- it's there it's are a way lot. too many. There yeah. are a lot. The dev room I was able to go to was the distributions dev room, and that was interesting because of one talk in particular that I thought was really important, and that was talking about Linux accessibility. Now, I am very passionate about making it so that Linux is useful by as many people as possible. And that includes the Linux desktop. So I was very interested in this talk about, you know, accessibility for helping people use the Linux desktop. Mm -hmm. And what pleased me was that Fedora KDE was accessible out of the box, which was great. I like it when my spin is, is good, but what was a little less great was how many weren't. So, and it wasn't just Fedora, it was everybody, Ubuntu, OpenSUSE. Like, as it turns out, People don't really know what it looks like to have accessibility, the accessibility stack available and enabled. And and the talk was illustrating like this is the ba- this is the stuff that you could just do. And it, and it, it improves the the quality of life. One thing that was a little bit of a surprise to me that I didn't think about was that having startup and shutdown se- sounds and notification sounds like a sound theme that covers all the actions in your of your of your system is an accessibility thing. Like being having a chime go off when the computer is actually ready to use tells people that are of low or are or, or blind or of impaired here vis, uh, impaired vision that there's a way for them to know that the computer is ready to use because otherwise it's not obvious. And I think about how even as a sighted person using a GNOME computer it is actually difficult for me to know when the computer is ready. One of the things that, so having used Mac OS mm-hmm. and uh, currently a full-time GNOME user, Mac OS hasn't had like uh, any form of chime for years. Right. No, I'm not, not saying that they decades. do. And then, and GNOME, when they dropped that, like that was, they dropped that with uh, GNOME 2, like going into GNOME 3. Yeah, they dropped it and, at 3.0. And I, the thing is, though, is I, it's not that I don't know. It's like I, pre, I actually do turn off my computer <laughs> when I'm not using it. It, I turn it off, but I have scripts because my, a computer is dash enabled that will turn on my computer, and knowing that it's on because it at least goes chime i'm at the login screen would be lovely because i've had times where i'm like i think it's uh running or i think it, my computer should be running but i come downstairs and it's uh, uh stuck at some prompt and so just you know, having a chime would be nice just for me, but uh, as like someone who can who has no sight impairment, but it would be a nice thing. But I can see how people with uh, you know, with an impairment, especially with sight, that would be more useful to them than to me uh, having a convenience. Well, it's it's weird to me because like I've I've been thinking about this, but the general trend for the last what fifteen years now has been to take sound themes away and just, just kind of eliminate notification sounds overall. Yeah. Yeah, that's even happening in on the in Windows, Windows side. Yeah. yeah. Like, I have a computer with Windows 10. It makes no sounds. And I didn't change anything. Yeah, that's just I, how it is. 
Yeah. And that, to me, that was, uh, just kind of funky when I, I turned on a windows computer for the first time in years. Cause the last windows I used was XP and you know, the opening, Oh, you logged in. Welcome type. Yeah. Uh, XP has the, has a login chime. Like when you log in and it's successful, it makes a sound. It tells yeah, you. So, uh, so when I, I think it was windows. Yeah, it was windows 10. Uh, and yeah, because no, Windows Vista no and Seven had it too. It was just very subtle. Yeah, I just I, it was like, oh, there's no Windows uh, welcome chime. So, I, yeah, that is strange that that's going away. But and I never really thought about it as an accessibility function. Yeah. Um, well, because of it, I you know in Fedora in KDE, sorry, in KDE Plasma, there is this new sound theme called Ocean which includes things like a startup and shutdown sound. And, you know, one of the things, one of the takeaways I had from this is to make sure that that sound actually is configured by default. If people don't like it, they can turn it off. But like from an accessibility point of view, right, I'm thinking about the live media case. You put it on, you go walk away. You want to know when it's all booted up. That's the only way you're going to know if you're, if you can't see. Yeah. Making sure that those sounds are there. And I wouldn't even begin to know how to make sounds happen again for Gnome. I can't find a setting like I have one laptop with with Gnome I, on it, and there's just I can't find a way either in tweaks or in in um, in the main Gnome control center to do it. I bet it's buried in deconf. Probably. But like, I think that we need to like I was very my eyes were opened up a lot to these little things that I've never thought about that make a big deal. The other one is making sure the screen reader is installed and actually works. Mm -hmm. Um, Turns out in KDE it works fine because we have allowed the Orca screen reader shortcuts to just work, even on Plasma Wayland. Um, Shockingly, they don't work on GNOME, which is weird to me because Orca is in fact a GNOME project, so it should work, but it doesn't. So um, that was actually... um, a real blow to me that I, I I did not expect that to not work. I know that one of the big initiatives with the sovereign tech fund, and it, it, if you're not familiar with the sovereign tech fund, it's basically uh, the money that was donated to Gnome by the German government to, to basically add functionality to Gnome. And one of the big fu- one of the big things is accessibility, and that, yeah, w- that's something I think we uh, that need that definitely does need to get fixed. And it, I'll we'll link this talk in the show notes, and uh, I'll have the links to the Sovereign Tech Fund. So you, if you want to follow the development that's going on there, that something that's really interesting to follow. So I'd like to issue a pseudo show challenge to both of you. Neil, I think it makes sense for you the next year you are at Fosdom to collect swag from every single booth. And I know that I believe in you that you can do it. And I'm pretty sure that Brandon believes in you that you could do it. But I think when you come back from Fosdom next year, because I know you want to go, I'm very curious what your suitcase looks like when it is completely filled with swag and we will be cross-referencing all of the swag from all of the booths on that episode of the pseudo show i'm pretty sure bill you want me to be a dead man walking don't you you'll be fine i I will not be fine bill that campus is huge there are it's like four buildings of booths no i'm not doing that one one booth, uh, one building per day or one building per half day. I think I think we can make that work. And Brandon, your pseudo show challenge is to integrate Home Assistant into that PC that gets stuck at startup to where a all of your smart lights in your house turn red and sirens go off if that PC doesn't start up correctly. No, my wife would shoot me. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> the best part of that Brandon, is that your she would wife blame. Would shoot Bill. No, no. Brandon would be blamed. That's that's how that works. I I am. I am just the initiator of an idea in Brandon's head. Oh my gosh. No, you are not living rent free in Brandon's head for this. Uh, no, I uh, actually, the uh, what I'll do is I'll just have a push notification go to my phone. <laughs> 
I suppose that's acceptable. All the red lights and siren would be it more funny. How about to this? Me. We make the red lights and sirens happen here at your place. That requires VPN tunneling or some other direct network access, which is not going to happen. I th- anyway, I think we should do it anyway. So, moving so on. Neil, I'm going to send you a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> All right. We'll plug it in and hijack into the network. I will know. I check my network every day for unknown devices. I will know. I'm that meticulous with how I do my networking it, here. This Raspberry Pi, it's a gift. Though. It's a <laughs> gift. <laughs> so, Neil, that wasn't the only show that you were conference that you attended while you were overseas. You also got to attend CentOS Connect, which to me is a conference that deserves a lot of mention and a lot of conversation because of the amazing work that they do on the CentOS project. And not only that, you got to give a talk while you were over there. So I'm curious, what was your talk about? What was the keynote about? And how was that conference? Well, I don't think we really had a keynote per se for CentOS Connect, although it was very it was very special and fun. Um, oh, wait, there was. It was, wasn't it about something called CentOS Connect? Kino White? Oh, you. Sh- no, no, no. Bad bill. Bad. So CentOS Connect was uh, ran just a couple days before Fosdem proper, and it was largely uh, a way for the community to come together and meet up and and do things. So the first day was uh, a half day of meetups and a half day of talks. And the first half day was um, the hyperscale SIG and the alternative image SIG, which were two SIGs that I'm a member of, where we were, I was in those meetups. And, you know, it, we got to meet a bunch of people who were new to CentOS and the community and wanted to find out more about what we were doing in hyperscale and alt images. And we had great discussions about what we are doing and what we're planning to do and how we're moving forward on stuff. And some of that even included doing work in Fedora, because a large part of what CentOS hyperscale actually does is backport the experience that Fedora offers to the enterprise Linux platform that is CentOS Stream. And so you want to have, you know, a more Fedora-like experience with a longer life cycle in a community-supported manner. CentOS Hyperscale offers a lot of that. Um, the big exciting thing this this uh, this event was we now have the hyperscale spin is back for CentOS 9. Uh, and we now have images for hyperscale GNOME and hyperscale KDE. Can you briefly tell us what the goal of the hyperscale SIG is for those who might not know? Sure. So the CentOS hyperscale SIG is largely a place for people to work on stuff that they want to have for using CentOS in la- at large scale deployments. So it was originally founded by Meta, um, Twitter, and Datto together to create the, well, me when I was at Datto, and uh, then folks at Meta and Twitter uh, to create this SIG um, in 2021. And since then, we've done a lot of work both within the aspects of the SIG itself, but also to contributing to CentOS with CentOS Stream 9. Almost all of the initial contributions for CentOS Stream 9 actually came from Hyperscale SIG members. Um, there's a lovely little page that is a, that has those listed out. And I think I got a backpack out of it um, at one point, but, you know, it's a uh, fun swag stuff. So like the CentOS.com, sla- uh, com, CentOS.org slash Stream 9, you know, they list these... Uh, notable community contributions these were all with the exception of one of them were all hyperscale people and hyperscale also has somewhat functioned as an incubator for other SIGs. like intel came into hyperscale doing work around how do we improve the performance around x86 you know leveraging new cpu features and stuff and that got spun out into the isa sig and um, the live media and cloud image work that Hyperscale does got spun out into the alternative images SIG. So in in some respects, the Hyperscale SIG is also an incubator for people to to try out new things that would benefit the CentOS community at large. And if it reaches a certain level of critical mass, it can get spun out into its own special interest group and and have its own, you know, being supported well on its own. So what 
was your talk specifically about then at CentOS Connect? Because it sounds like you have a lot of deep knowledge, not only of the overall project, not only of your special interest group, but to where they wanted you to present a talk. So I'm very curious, what was your talk about specifically? So this was more or less kind of an update on what the Hyperscale SIG had been doing. So usually at the CentOS events, like either one's affiliated or adjunct to another one or its own event or like Flock or whatever. Um, If there's a CentOS track, the Hyperscale SIG tries to participate and we talk about what we were doing. And so each one of these, we have a Hyperscale SIG update that's from the last time we gave a talk to the current time, talking about what we do and what we've accomplished and what we're moving towards. Um, This usually also winds up showing up in blog form on blog.centos.org. But it's a... It's a good way for us to talk about it in a way where we can kind of give color and context and and show people like really the neat things that are going on. And I expect that the recordings for CentOS Connect will start coming out real soon. And if they're um, up by the time we get around to publishing this, we'll make sure that the links are in the show notes for these things. One question that I've always had that maybe requires a little bit of clarification is what is the difference between... CentOS and Fedora Server, because to me, those kind of seem very similar, but they may have more specialized use cases that I'm not aware of. So is there any clarification or context that you can provide for maybe a use case for each one of those? There are no use case differences. So that's the controversial hot take here. There are no use case differences. It's all about how close you want to be to the thing. So the way I tend to I look at it is you have the software being made and then you have Fedora packaging it and then you have this latency from the time that it gets into that it becomes part of, for example, Rallin and CentOS stream. So if you look at a CentOS server versus a Fedora server, it is what options you have for when a when an issue comes up and it needs to be fixed. In a Fedora server context, What you have is you can go to the upstream software people and tell them that there's this problem because the version that's in Fedora is often very close to what is the version that they have upstream or very close to it. They'll take a look at it and probably make a fix or whatever, and it can be brought into Fedora very quickly. When you are using a CentOS or a RHEL or some kind of LTS or LTM kind of environment, you will have more lag because the software is older. And so your options there are either uh, are likely either if you can get a backported fix, if it's presuming it's been fixed already at some point, then that can happen. Or you just kind of have to live with it being broken in that in that way. So really the difference is what kind of reaction time and what kind of availability for improvements and in fixes and, and engagement that you can have. The closer to upstream, the higher chance that those kinds of things, that you have more options for engagement, interactions, improvements, fixes, that sort of thing. So in Fedora Server, you're close with the pitfall of the life cycles being shorter, so you have to you know do upgrades more. With CentOS, you're further away, and your life cycles are longer, so you have to do it. You know, you wind up having. Uh, more time in between having to do those kinds of things. The other way to also look at it is, you know, how often do you uh, are how much effort and time you're willing to put into paying off tech debt as you upgrade or maintain your systems. With Fedora servers, you're basically on a treadmill of upgrading at most once a year, or at least once a year, at most twice a year, and that means that you know you're 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 going to be driven towards optimizing around. Um, having automation, having you know a very clear a clear maintenance model for being able to upgrade and support these systems. When you're using CentOS or RHEL or SLES or whatever, right? Then you are in a realm where you don't have to do it so frequently, so you can let things kind of pile up. But when you have to do those upgrades, you're paying all that down all at once, and you're probably spending a lot more time on that on that window. So it's dependent on which way you want to actually do this. My personal opinion is that you probably want to spend a little bit of time all the time. Not not necessarily all the time, but like I will take more frequency with less effort than lower frequency, but higher effort each time because um, it's easier to plan for. It's easier to handle and it's easier to 
to to to reason. Um, and I've been in environments where that gets to the extreme, where you wait so long that you're now spending weeks or months or sometimes even years to do it. And that's a trade-off I personally don't like to make. Now, sometimes you're in organizations where you don't really have a choice. There's just too many people to work with. There's too... The, the amount of, of coordination effort that it takes is just so high that you really don't have a choice and you need the longer life cycles. And then that's fine, right? So it's about your organizational risk management. It's your organizational tolerance for effort and timing and scheduling, and also about the scale in which you're doing deployments. Because all those things have impacts on how you're able to reason reasonably handle maintenance on some kind of regular cadence. That's very helpful information and maybe something that a lot of IT administrators out there are asking of themselves is where do I fit in the the conversation between we'll call it Fedora server, CentOS stream, RHEL, and then maybe something else like Alma or Rocky Linux if they want to stay in the RPM space. But I think, Neil, this is part of a conversation that we may need to have on future episodes of this Sudo show in decision making for an open source business. You know, where where do these use cases fall? And and that's perhaps something that we should talk about on future episodes. Only if Brandon's gonna be there to 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 mediate our my strong opinion here. I don't know. I probably have a similar opinion. <laughs> so it's probably not much of a debate. <laughs> so it will be my responsibility to throw wild cards at both of you and play devil's advocate from I think yeah, from a variety of different platforms. So prepare to either be questioned, trolled or both by me. Wait, we, I thought we already expect that from you. You should. That's that's why I'm I'm here. I I There's only I, trolling. There yeah. is only trolling. I should just get a little digital sign above my head that says Sudo Show Troll. Maybe that's something we put on a t-shirt someday down the road. I will personally endorse this. But in the meanwhile, Neil, I appreciate you filling us in on the ins and outs of CentOS, Hyperscale, and some of those other SIGs, only because from my own use case, I've used CentOS before. I wasn't too sure of how things were going to go with Stream. I haven't had too many issues in my own workloads deploying or using stream, I found it to be pretty straightforward as everything else with CentOS tends to be. And thank you for clarifying that life cycle, we'll call it, of updates and deployment regarding CentOS. Was there any particular other speech or discussion at CentOS that you thought might be worth mentioning to everybody out there? We talked about CentOS 10. CentOS 10. Yes, apparently Red Hat has learned how to count numbers early. Uh, well, the joke is, uh, they historically speaking, Red Hat has not acknowledged the fact that future versions of RHEL can and will exist. Um, and so the joke oftentimes is that, oh yeah, we've learned how to count to 8 or 9 or 10 or whatever. And now, but don't bring up RHEL X because apparently that makes everyone flip out. Wait a minute, so... If we have CentOS 10, does that make it CentOS X? Like yeah. Mac OS X. So are you saying that CentOS X and Mac OS X, no, those can't be the same things. <laughs> well, you know, it, ha- it helps that the, uh, that the rel, that rel is now on a three-year f- li- uh, release cycle in terms of major versions and a predictable releases for minor. So it's much, it's easier to get there. Where, whereas I think the longest between a, a rel major release was almost four and a half years. Yeah. I believe so, that was what six to seven or no, either, seven to eight, seven to eight was long. Cause it was super late, right? Cause seven was 2014. And we didn't get RHEL 8 until 2019. Something like that. Yeah, that's <laughs> long time. What that does is that makes me really think about and appreciate the coordination of relationships between key stakeholders at RHEL, CentOS, and Fedora to make sure that something like CentOS 10 is released in such a way or developed in such a way 
so that it doesn't become too siloed from its upstream or downstream partners. I think that's something that's rather unique to that, where there is a collaboration between multiple entities to ensure that all of those distributions are playing nice together in the business space. So how long does it take for everybody to kind of get on the same page to talk about what features they want to see in the next CentOS that eventually may trickle into RHEL or Fedora server or even one of the workstation spins? I don't know. Because um, a lot of the feature development for CentOS is decided by the RHEL folks, you know, for... Uh, for that. So like they'll take Fedora features and changes that have happened over the the time windows between the last rel and the current one, the upcoming one, and they'll look at it and make a calls, judgment calls on what they want to do. Um, what Hyperscale winds up doing is essentially anything that Red Hat leaves out for rel gets pulled in to CentOS stream and and shipped in the, for example, the hyperscale workstation variants with GNOME and KDE and so on. Um, so usually, uh, you know, the Red Hat has a particular idea of how they want the various um, workload types for RHEL to be made available, handled, supported, and then sometimes that doesn't fully line up with what the community wants. And so you'll see things like the alternative images SIG or the hyperscale SIG um, filling in those gaps. Well, Nia, I look forward to exploring CentOS hyperscale more with you offline since you are here in my recording studio. And on the other side of that wall is my rack and lab. And that's where all the fun kind of things happen on the side here. But I, I'd like to learn more about maybe deploying CentOS hyperscale across multiple nodes and learning some of the clustering or thought process that goes into that. But again, that's something that you and I can do offline. And I know that you're going to be traveling more in the next upcoming months to more conferences. And I think it's important that we talk about some of the neat features of those conferences and encourage our listeners to register and attend some of those events, meet the people that put the time and effort into the projects that create and become inspired to either contribute financially, contribute with code, marketing, documentation, bug reporting, a number of different ways. But get out there and, and support these types of events so that we can keep having them and expanding the use of open source in the business world. But for now, we need to say goodbye, and we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you as always, for listening or watching The Sudo Show, a proud member of the Tux Digital Network, and we'll see you soon.